Welcome to class. It's Prof. Sanyangu's Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you are just joining us or you have not subscribed, you will like it. Please do it now and be part of this amazing anatomy family. This is a lecture series on embryology of the heart. The lecture is divided into five parts. Part one is on formation of the primary heart tube. Part two is on the development of the atrium. Part three is on the development of the ventricles and the outflow tract. Part four, which you're watching now, is on the clinical correlates of heart embryology. In part five, we'll test our knowledge of what we have learned in all the parts through our question and answer section, where we will answer related questions from various examination boards. Let's go to class. The first clinical condition we'll consider will be defects associated with formation of a pulmonary septum. And the first we'll look at is persistent truncus arteriosus, PTA. This is a condition in which one large vessel leaves the heart and receives blood from both the right and the left ventricles. This is caused by abnormal or partial development of the AP septum, that's orticopulmonary septum. PTA is usually accompanied by a membranous ventricular septal defect, as we can note here. It's also associated with clinically marked cyanosis. This is a bluish coloration of the skin caused by low blood oxygen level. The transposition of the great arteries. This is a condition in which the aorta here arises abnormally from the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk here arises abnormally from the left ventricle. Systemic and pulmonary circulations are completely separated from each other. There is non-spiral development of the AP septum. This anomaly is usually incompatible with life. L transposition of the great vessels. This is also called congenitally corrected transposition. Here, the aorta and pulmonary trunk are transposed and the ventricles are inverted such that the anatomical right ventricle lies on the left side and opens into the aorta and the anatomical left ventricle lies on the right side and opens into the pulmonary artery. The double inversion by the ventricular chambers and great vessels counterbalance each other such that blood flow pattern becomes normal. Tetralogy of Fallow This is an abnormal development of the AP septum such that pulmonary trunk has unusually small diameter while the aorta has extraordinarily large diameter. Tetralogy of Fallow is characterized by four classic malformations. One, pulmonary stenosis, which is the narrowing of the pulmonary valve. Two, right ventricular hypertrophy, which is pathologic increase in muscle mass of the right ventricle in response to the pressure overload. Three, overriding aorta, where aorta is positioned directly over a ventricular septal defect instead of over the left ventricle, causing the aorta to receive blood from the right ventricle, which reduces amount of oxygen in the blood. And four, ventricular septal defect. The mnemonic PROV can be helpful. Tetralogy of Fallow is associated clinically with marked cyanosis as a result of right to left shunting of blood. The clinical consequence depends primarily on the severity of pulmonary stenosis. This defect is the commonest congenital cyanotic heart defect. We'll consider defects associated with the atrial wall. Atrial septal defect. This any condition where there is a defect in interatrial septum 
which results in the communication between right and left atrium. There will be mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, giving rise to symptoms like sinuses, breathlessness, and others. We have different types of atrial septal defects. We have septum primum defect, septum secundum, persistent foramen oval, also called propatency of foramen oval. We have premature or prenatal closure of foramen oval. We have co trilocular biventricular, which is simply called common atrium. Septum primum defect. Here, septum primum fails to reach the septum intermedium. As a result, foramen primum will persist. In foramen secundum defect, it's a condition where septum secundum fails to cover foramen secundum. This defect occurs if septum secundum does not grow downward adequately to overlap the septum primum or if the septum primum undergoes excessive resorption. As a result, foramen secundum remains large and unclosed. This will give rise to patent foramen oval. It is the most significant atrial septal defect. Propatency of foramen oval. This is a small flap-like opening that can pass a probe seen between septum primum and septum secundum. It comes as a result of incompletely closed foramen oval and can be seen in about 20 to 25 percent of the population. It usually causes no signs or symptoms and rarely requires treatment. The effect is so small that blood cannot pass between the two atria. Common atrium. This is caused by failure of septum primum and septum secundum to develop. It is the most serious congenital anomaly of the atria and is always associated with other defects of the heart and will result in formation of three chambered heart, that is one atrium and two ventricles. In premature closure of foramen oval, the closure of foramen oval occurs during prenatal life. This will result in massive hypertrophy of right side of the heart and underdevelopment of the left side of the heart. We will consider atrioventricular septal defects. The first one we'll look at is persistent common AV canal. This is a condition in which the common AV canal is never partitioned into the right and left AV canals so that a large hole can be found in the center of the heart here. This is caused by failure of fusion of the dosal and ventral AV cushions. So, the tricuspid and bicuspid valves are represented by this one valve common to both sides of the heart. We'll look at hypoplastic right heart or tricuspid atresia. This is a condition in which there is complete agenesis of the tricuspid valve so that there is no communication between the right atrium and the right ventricle. This point where the valve is supposed to be is sealed. This is caused by an insufficient amount of AV cushion tissue for the formation of the tricuspid valve. It is usually associated with clinically marked sinuses and is always accompanied by patent foramen oval, as you can note here, interventricular septal defects, also here, and overdeveloped left ventricle here, as compared with the underdeveloped right ventricle. Double outlet right ventricular defect. In this defect, the aorta and pulmonary artery connect partially or completely to the right ventricle here. Usually a hole exists between the two 
ventricles. Ventricular septal defects. This is a condition where there is a defect or opening in the interventricular septum that will result in communication between the right and the left ventricles. Blood flows from the left to the right ventricle. It's actually the most common congenital anomaly of the heart. This defect is most common in the membranous part of the interventricular septum. It is caused by failure of fission of the right and left bulbar ridges with the AV cushions, which form the membranous part of the interventricular septum. As a result of the left to right shunting of blood, the output from the left ventricle is reduced. Consequently, the patient complains of excessive fatigue on exertion. We also have common ventricle or co-tricochlear biatriatum. And this is caused by failure of the membranous and muscular septa to form. This will lead to a trichem bad heart. In this condition, we will have two atria and one ventricle. Next is patent ductus arteriosus. This occurs when the ductus arteriosus, a connection between the left pulmonary artery and aorta fails to close. Normally, the ductus arteriosus functionally closes within a few hours after birth through smooth muscle contraction and will eventually form the ligamentum arteriosus. This defect causes left to right shunting of oxygen-rich blood from the aorta back into the pulmonary circulation. This defect is one of the most common congenital anomalies of the great vessels. PDA can be treated with prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors such as indometacine, acetylcholine, histamine, and catecholamines, all of which promote closure of the ductus arteriosus. This is where we will end this part of a lecture. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please throw them in the comment section. And if you like the video, press the like button and share it to your friends. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. See you in my next video. Thank you and bye for now.